live. I hope this is working because <laughs> we've already tried to do this once before and I am technologically deficient. So uh, it did not work. I wasted John and David's time and their time is precious. So I'm sorry about that. Thank you for joining me again, though. Well, thank you for inviting us and and absolutely no problem. These things sometimes, you know, teething problems with something new. But this is exciting to be part of this new platform and getting getting more information out in a different way. So that's great. Yeah, we, as as you say, we we sort of sometimes fall foul of uh, technical problems occasionally, and also sort of um, the gremlins, as we call them. You know, when we uh, I had it the other day talking to I've been interviewed and. Uh, you get attacked, you know, and something throttles back your feed and uh, makes a mess of things. So we come to expect this sort of thing occasionally because, uh, you know, as they say, or as George Orwell said, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. And unfortunately, those are the days we're in at the moment. So, you know, it's interesting you say that. I, uh, several months ago, I was interviewing Dr. Carrie Madej and we were discussing uh, her work and, you know, looking at the, the ingredients of the shots under a microscope and the connection kept on cutting out. And I sort of made a passive joke like, Oh, they're probably watching us. And she said with a straight face, they're definitely watching us. Mm. <laughs> it was just like, Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully it's not the same because this, this conversation isn't, doesn't have anything to do with COVID. Maybe we'll get into it a little bit in some, you know, tertiary parts of the conversation, but we're talking about the nature of reality here. So I, I want to open up, um, <laughs> was something that I thought when I was a kid quite a bit. Um, I would walk around, you know, in my day-to-day -day life in elementary school, and I would have these thoughts like, no one else around me is real. I'm the only one here. I'm the only one here that is actually real. And that, that thought really freaked me out. So from the time I was young, even before I went down the rabbit hole of health and, and you know, 9-11 and the government and everything like that, I had always questioned my existence and like my place in this reality. And like, is this real? Is, is this material fleshy suit that I'm wearing all that it is? Am I a part of it? Is it separate of me? Am I separate of other people? What is this, you know, like what, what is this reality that we're in? So with that, with that really uh, <laughs> very basic uh, explanation and, and discussion, let's, let's get started and uh, ask you first, what is the nature of reality according to Don Lester and David Parker? Okay, well, first, first, let me say, obviously, it's um, it's a complex subject, uh, um, but only because it doesn't. And when I say complex, I don't mean that it is highly technical. It's just that we're starting. To, we have to deal with sort of abstract things, because <clears throat> we will find. I hope as we discuss this, and bearing in mind that we may only be discussing it for maybe an hour, hour and a half or something. And Dawn and I, some many years ago, used to do a course on the nature of reality to teach people about it. And that used to take a minimum of four days, four full days. So you can see that that's the problem we start with. So we're going to try and give some pointers, tips, some thoughts for people to contemplate, uh, which we think and hope will be helpful to them so it's we have to start with realizing um that we we as human beings living in this three-dimensional reality that we live in um we have limited vocabulary that is only appropriate to describe a three-dimensional reality so as we want to be able to start to talk about an expanded reality the nature of reality is not limited to three dimensions. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we start to run into problems with language. We don't have the vocabulary to describe things that are beyond three dimensional. But also, we don't have the uh, mental capacity. This has nothing to do with intelligence. It's just if you think about it, we can only think in three dimensional terms. We can't think outside that so again we have uh, a conceptual problem of being able to think of things that are not three-dimensional and we have a vocabulary which um, stops us from describing it properly and this of course is why many of the uh, mystics eastern or otherwise um, often didn't bother to try because they'd uh, they knew they couldn't and uh, so 
people would think they were just being uh, mysterious. But really, they just realize that it's something you can only get so far with you by using intellect. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes um, an experience thing. It becomes something you ex can only experience and not something you can describe. So, but we'll do our best. So, uh, yeah, well, you said it took you four days to teach the course. So hopefully you can <laughs> summarize four days in an hour. Maybe we'll have to do it. I'm, we're already doing a multi-part series with you with Health Freedom for Humanity. So maybe we'll do a multi-part series on the nature of reality here. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll see how we go. We'll yep. see how we go. Uh, and I'm not uh, just saying this is some sort of excuse to shortchange people. We you know it's uh, I'm sort of setting the scene so they can mm -hmm. real, so that people realize that uh, it's not as straightforward as well, for my part, describing electrical engineering or uh, or uh, anything else, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for me and and for Dawn, um, we when we met uh, many years ago, um, <clears throat> and looking at the nature of reality, which was which we then put into a little book uh, called the Nature of Reality, which uh, at that time we we're going back fifteen, seventeen years. Uh, we, for various reasons, uh, wrote under a, a pen name, which was NOR. Uh, we didn't write under our uh, present names, which we write under now. But uh, we don't need to go into the reasons. It's still available. We we have a Nature of Reality website, so people can go to it and get more information if they wish. What is the title of that? Um, the nature of reality dot com. Okay, you got the domain. <laughs> nice. Good. That's awesome. <laughs> so nice and easy. So. Um, when I first started looking at it, before I met Dawn, because um, it had been an interest of mine for since I was a teenager, really, um, because uh, I uh, was brought up in the church, uh, Christianity, and uh, went to Sunday school and uh, church and was a member of the church choir and all that, I started to ask, wanted to ask questions because it always seemed very important to me to know um, what life was about, whether it was uh, there was a purpose to it and um, why we were here and what happened to us when we died you know so these to me seem fairly basic questions which um, everyone everyone ought to be interested in knowing the answer to but as i found out in my naivety that uh, most people weren't interested in that at all and some of you thought i was uh, being rather strange by wanting to know so but uh, it didn't put me off so i persisted and um uh, eventually found, of course, that the church, any church, couldn't answer the questions. Um, they could only go so far. And then it was left up to blind faith, which I was never happy with. I, I thought we could do better than that. And so I started uh, studying comparative religions to see if um, any other religions had better answers. And I did I happen to start with Buddhism. Um, um, what I found, kind of long story short, is that uh, all religions have some nice uh, golden nuggets of knowledge within them, but uh, none of the uh, official religions had uh, any complete answers, but some some were better than others, and I happen to find that uh, the Eastern religions, uh, mainly because probably many, most of them are older <laughs> than the Western religions, had uh, better traditions and did have some uh, better answers. Did you say that like most... Most, if not all, of the world's major religions at their root are really trying to explain the same thing from a limited viewpoint with limited language? Yes. Well, within the actual writings, yes. Um, but it's when it gets to the kind of um, practical, um, the rituals and all those kinds of things, that's when it moves away from the basis of, of what's in those teachings. And, and that's where you get religions kind of creating dogmatic yes creating ways of trying to I, I suppose you know they're often called sort of ways of controlling people but they're the ways of controlling how people understand what's going on and obviously not allowing people to really understand because then that would give them uh, you know a knowledge about who they really are and of course when you know that then you don't need the middlemen as it were so if because we we are limited to time uh in this so let's yeah, let, up. i'm sorry <laughs> so let, no 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 i'm j just setting the scene um as to why i'm going to ask the first question for us to sort of contemplate which is I may say a basic question and that's how do we perceive reality how do we perceive it so um if we think about it 
we only have the five senses, don't we? Sight, taste, touch, smell, hearing. That's all we have to uh, just our five senses. So the next question we need to ask is, do we think that our five senses can give us um, an accurate picture of what whatever reality is, whatever we may think it is, can our five senses give us an accurate picture of it? And if we examine them briefly, um, we'll see that obviously they can't. And we can give a few examples. I mean, if we look at sight, which is quite a, a major sense, we know that there is a thing called the electromagnetic spectrum. And we know that uh, the visual part of it is very tiny. And uh, we, we so the, the light spectrum, and we see it um, in the rainbow, you know, so we have very limited vision, but we do know that within that electromagnetic spectrum, going off one way, it goes off into lots of other frequencies, right up to, uh, you know, and beyond ultraviolet. And uh, in the other direction, it goes off, depending on the wavelengths, into the infrared range. But none of these things we can see with our eyes, but we do know that they exist, they can be measured, and with special equipment, we can see them and we use them, you know, within the scientific community. But we do know that there are some animals that uh, can see further into the spectrum, even insects, you know, they're realizing can see uh, further into the, sp the electromagnetic spectrum. So, again, it's just to give an example of how, so just in what we can see, our senses are not giving us the full picture. And we, we have the same with the hearing, you know, we have a fairly limited range that we can hear. But again, there are animals, dogs, cats, dolphins, <laughs> can hear far greater a uh, far greater range of frequencies than we can. So in just those two senses, uh, we can see that our senses are actually limiting our perception of reality and that other creatures would will be experiencing a very different reality to what we are now uh, and, and so on. I mean, we can look at smell. I mean, we know that uh, dogs and animals like dogs have a tremendously powerful uh, range of smell that we, we have no comparison at all. You know, it's thousands of times more sensitive than us. So again, a different world for them. So I'm only saying these things just to give people an idea so that they can start thinking of their five senses um, as filters. So they are actually filtering out more information than they're letting through. So they're giving us a very limited view of whatever, again, I say whatever reality is, they're giving us a very filtered down view of it. Okay. Now, with if we look at uh, what the sciences tell us, and uh, in, in particular quantum physics, which is sort of people think of as the, uh, the cutting edge of science. I mean, that's the whole... Uh, thing that uh, physics are trying to do to measure and find out what the physical world is and quantum physics gets into some really strange ideas mm -hmm. but one thing that they do tell us is that uh, everything is made of atoms and i'm sure we can all remember from our school days uh, about atoms uh, which uh, has a nucleus and orbiting electrons and that everything is made of atoms okay well if we think about that what is an atom? Um, well, first of all, as I say, we've got a nucleus with orbiting electrons. So these electrons are whizzing around the nucleus at huge speeds. And there are spaces between each atom and its orbiting electrons. Okay. Um, so first of all, our sense of touch doesn't give us any perception of that whatsoever mm. so you know the chair we're sitting on and the desk that we're sat in front of you know we can tap it and it seems solid and the chair seems solid we don't slide through the floor and yet it's made up of atoms and electrons that are a space between them and they're in constant motion our senses give us no idea about this so again we're deceived and science tells us that if they look further at uh, what a, an atom is and they look at its nucleus and they go, well, it's made of neutrons and protons. And well, OK, well, what are they made of? Uh, well, we're not really sure. And cutting a long story short, it boils down to their description of what things are made of is, well, energy. OK, but what is the energy? 
and then this is where they come up blank again well we don't really know um, so this is where the problems start so we we've now got in a very short space of time an idea that uh, no one actually knows what this reality that we take for granted is made of our senses certainly don't tell us and science doesn't tell us so it all boils down to this mysterious thing called energy which no one actually knows what that is uh, so that's where the problems start okay now in our research because we did research a lot of work by various quantum physicists and some in particular the more enlightened ones and uh, one in particular a professor Amit Goswami um, who wrote a book called the self-aware universe the self-aware universe and it is still available and uh, is a very enlightening book and obviously people can tell from his name that he has sort of one foot in uh, the east and one foot in the west with uh, because he was uh, all his work was done in America so he he has a great interest and knowledge of these sort of Eastern philosophies. And so it was probably easy for him to start to understand some of these more uh, weird concepts about what reality is. But he said a very interesting thing, which is stuck in my mind. He said that people will never understand what this reality is until they understand that matter, energy and consciousness are actually the same thing mm. and that's quite a profound thing energy matter and consciousness are the same thing okay and another physicist who i do believe is still around uh, harold potoff um, who uh, works for uh, stanford research institute uh, now we may have some uh, reservations about uh, Stanford Research Institute and their connections with the CIA <laughs> and, the uh, and they did a lot of work and how Putoff did a lot of work with the CIA which and some of it which is actually very interesting with uh, sort of remote viewing yeah. and uh, uh, have you seen the, like the declassified CIA documents on remote viewing yeah. yeah so real stuff I mean the Russians were doing it as well and that's probably probably what prompted the Americans to do it because they knew the Russians were doing it to spy on them remotely uh, yeah, so they real, real, real quick David for for the people who are watching this you can literally find them um, a lot of these documents if you go to CIA.gov they have a reading room full of declassified um, documents and you can find a number of documents on remote viewing and other things relating to consciousness. Just wanted to throw that in there for the people watching. Yeah, yeah, which just goes to show that even though they may have thought it was uh, or, or put out the idea that, oh, well, you know, that's that sort of nonsense stuff, you know, it's all for the hippies or whatever, uh, they, they were actually seriously looking at it. They were using the hippies, the, be the best of the best hippies to... <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, a lot of people we think of as hippies were... were part of these different uh, programs so yeah no we know that but again they're, but but it shows that they uh knew there was something involved you know because yeah. if it really wasn't something that they could uh use and test and experiment with they wouldn't have bothered so yes it's very yeah. re revealing i mean there was one just to give people a bit of an idea if they've not come across remote viewing this is how seriously was taken as dawn said by the cia who used it for years decades to spy on other countries and uh, they they used several people and one of them one of the best ones was a guy strange name called ingo swan uh, he's not around anymore but uh, you know they could literally sit him in a room and give him some map map coordinates that's all just map coordinates and ask him to remote view and tell them what he saw uh, needless to say, a lot of these map coordinates were places in Russia, secret, uh, secret uh, buildings and things like that. But uh, he could give them accurate descriptions of what he could see. So quite an amazing thing, really. And obviously worked. Otherwise, they'd have dispensed with it very quickly if they had, didn't get uh, satisfactory results. So this shows, again, that something very strange is going off beyond normal physics, something uh, way, way different, some act of consciousness you know so it soon you soon start to realize that consciousness is not something that's confined to the brain it's greater than and uh, this is the start to get to the key of it 
Consci no, I was just going to say that consciousness isn't even tied to time and space as well, um, because obviously the remote, uh, the viewing, it, it's done, um, in, you know, it's simultaneous time. You know, they can sort of view things that are happening at the same time. So it's, it's definitely... Yeah, they're also <laughs> from the remote viewing things, the documents they declassified, they would remote view at certain grid coordinates in the past. Yeah. Yes, that was the interesting thing. And they said, oh, no, that they were seeing something. They said, oh, no, that's not there. But when they looked in, it was there. So, again, the, the time. Uh, so, again, it's outside time and space, which which actually makes it very interesting. I mean, quantum physics are happy to accept uh, this uh, non non-existence of time and space. Uh, they are constructs of consciousness, which we may get into a little more. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're able to formulate uh, what they called entanglement, or uh, as uh, Einstein, Albert Einstein, actually called it, because he never actually totally understood it re remarkably, and he called it spooky action at a distance. <laughs> Non-locality. Yeah. So a real scientific term, wasn't it? Spooky yeah. action at a distance. Um, but yes, it's as Dawn said, um, time and space um, didn't have any effect on it. So something in one location could have a direct effect on something in another location absolutely instantaneously. And uh, regardless of what that distance was, it could be on the other side of the planet or whatever. Uh, and th this was all provable stuff. So they knew that something very weird was going on. Now, I, I mentioned Hal Puthoff uh, because he said something very interesting and also Albert Einstein because uh, Albert Einstein is famous for that equation E equals MC squared. Yeah, we probably all remember it. E being energy, M being mass and C squared being the speed of light. So speed of light. So massive amounts of energy. Now, what was interesting that Hal Puthoff discovered, another quantum physicist, is he reinterpreted it as saying what it really represents is the amount of energy required to give the appearance of matter. Again, quite a profound thing to say if you think about it. So E equals MC squared is the amount of energy required to give the appearance of matter. <laughs> Not matter, the appearance of matter. Quite important things. Okay, so other, as we studied many of these different quantum physicists, obviously we can't go into all of them and their discoveries, but we found that the better ones almost invariably as they looked further into what reality was became more as philosophers and even mystics themselves and there's another quantum physicist who well, i like his uh, what he said but his name escapes me for the moment unless dawn remembers it uh, where he said that they can honestly say john wheeler, I think. john wheeler right again unfortunately no longer with us but he actually said that quantum physics cannot say that there is an out there, out there. Again, a weird thing, but they, could, they can't prove that there is an out there. What he's saying is that you, they can't actually prove that there is an external reality, which is bizarre, isn't it? Uh, but these are the conclusions right at the cutting edge of quantum physics that they're coming up with. So again, we start to think, well, what, what actually is reality? You know, quantum physics has shown us that it, there is no solid reality, you know, uh, it's just energy. And it doesn't even, they can't even show that it is separate to us. Certainly not solid and separate to us. So we start mm -hmm. to, we start to get this strange feeling of uh, it's, things are not at all what we thought they were. So to try and help us try and help us get a bit of a grasp on where we're going with this. Um, I often use, uh, John and I often use the dream analogy. So if people think about, well, what happens in a dream? When you're fully asleep and really into a dream, you're not aware that you're dreaming, of course, and you construct a reality which appears to be solid and separate to you. And you interact with it as if it is solid and separate to you. So, again, you can walk down streets, you can meet people, uh, you can feel emotions, uh, fear, you know, if you're having a nightmare. Um, 
But at the time you're dreaming, you're not aware of it. And it's only when you wake up and you sort of dismiss it as, oh, that was just a dream. But, you know, not to do that. What it was is an altered state of consciousness where you have created a reality which appears to be solid and separate to you and you've then interacted with it. Okay. And really, I know in the limited time we've got, but what I would like people to think about is what's to say that this reality, which we call our everyday reality, is not any different to that, that it is a state of consciousness which we create. As we've said, quantum physics would be supportive of that, are supportive of that, because they can't prove that there is a solid reality that exists externally to us. So what's to say that it is another state of consciousness that we're, while we're embedded in it, it seems perfectly real, perfectly solid and separate to us in the same way as the dream reality. Or should I, let's change that. Let's say the reality that we create in the altered state of consciousness that we call dream. Okay. Mm. So, and in actual fact, um, that is much closer to the truth. This is what we have. And this is why it's important for people to start to know this and to know what they are. We are conscious creators in the same way as we create our dream reality. We create this reality and it's based on our fears and hopes and what we, and what we believe is possible and not possible. So I think at this point, I'm going to just read a little quote from um, an Eastern mystic who is unfortunately no longer with us. Um, his name was Sri Nizagadatta Maharaj. Okay. I love I, I have his book, I Am That. It's one that's, of my favorite Yes, yes. Okay. It, it, that's, that's actually from uh, extracted from that book. I mean, it's a, a, an amazing book, yeah. Mm -hmm. But for those who are not familiar with it, I'd like to just read this. It's only short, but it sort of sums up where we're going with this and what the Eastern mystics have known for a long time. And he said, you have made this world and you can change it. The world of which you are the only source and ground is fully within your power to change. What is created can always be dissolved and recreated. All will happen as you want it, providing you really want it. You have created the world's sorrows out of your own desires and fears. You deal with them. All is due to your having forgotten your own being, having given reality to the picture on the screen. You love its people and suffer for them and seek to save them. It is just not so. You must begin with yourself. There is no other way. Mm. I think it's a, a beautiful piece and really sums up. There's a lot in there if people can take it on board, which is in line with what we've been saying. So this is the importance of everyone becoming aware of what they are and becoming aware that they are not just flesh and blood. They're actually conscious beings who create and give the appearance of the flesh and blood. They give the appearance of this solid and separate world in the same way as they do in a dream. And it is, as uh, Maharaj said, it's based on your fears and desires, um, but people have forgotten what they are. And this is deliberate. We are trained not to know this. Mm -hmm. And the dark powers that are pulling the strings at the moment, this is their greatest fear for people to wake up and know what they are, to know that they are the creators of this world and they create it based on their fears. And this is why it's very important for the dark powers to keep us afraid, for those of us who don't know any better, that is, to keep us afraid, to make us feel small and insignificant. They want, and they talk to us all throughout our education, isn't it, you know, from school. And even in sort of higher education, we taught that, uh, you know, as, as we taught about uh, evolution, we taught really, and want, they want us to believe that we sort of just uh, were some biological accident 
that we evolved from pond scum, basically, and that uh, a life sort of over millions and millions of years developed from pond scum through the seas and then into uh, the higher life and the human beings. But there is no scientific evidence to prove this. There is nothing in the fossil records that shows how a fish of some sort developed into an elephant, you know, or a giraffe or a human being. So again, we're fed by the sort of uh, anthropology that uh, as if all of this is fixed and backed by science. But when you look into it, it, it isn't. And then again, this is where it, it all uh, starts to go wrong. And, but it all is designed to, as I say, to keep us to feel as human beings that we are pretty powerless. We are just a biological accident living on a planet. Some would even dispute quite what that is, of course, um, in a vast universe and that we are of no particular significance and that it would make no difference to the universe and the scheme of things if we disappeared either as human beings or as a complete race. This is what they'd have us believe. And that, uh, and all of that is untrue. Uh, now, I know all of the religions teach of a creator, um, you know, which some call God. Um, but I think the more you look into it, and this was what even where quantum physics were going, is to realize there is intelligence. Uh, there is an intelligent creator, whatever you might want to call it. This It's not just some random happening. Um, I like, uh, if I remember the quotation correctly, um, it was a mathematician, I don't know whether it was Hubble, who actually said, he said, if you, if you were to believe that the complexity of this world and everything in it was some sort of random accident, it would be akin to saying that a whirlwind blows through a junkyard and produces a 747 jet at the other end. You know, the likelihood of that happening, you just think, no. And um, and these were mathematicians who calculated the likelihoods of that sort of thing happening. So there is intelligence, uh, intelligent design. There is intelligence in, in everything, uh, whether it's a, a flower or a human being or an elephant. Um, and the more you look into it, the more that that becomes obvious. And uh, it's probably easier to accept for um, sort of religious people than it is for uh, Others that may be more skeptical, particularly atheists who don't believe they do, they do believe we're a biological accident and we're born, we live, and we die, and that's it. But uh, I mean, many years ago, when I was studying religions and uh, what the purpose of life is, or if there was a purpose, uh, I spent some time as an atheist. But I realised that didn't work either, you know, because I kept searching and looking and trying to make sense of things, and I realised that atheism doesn't answer the questions. Okay. Uh, uh, p please feel free to jump in and ask any questions. At, uh, oh, this is good. <laughs> this is good. One other thing I was going to say that we're definitely taught is that uh, we shouldn't be um, thinking of ourselves. Now, that's not, you know, because that's selfish. Now, um, that's quite a difficult concept because uh, we know that a lot of uh, what we need to deal with to understand what's going on is that we have to look at ourselves and look into uh, what's going on and our, you know, looking at shadows and those kinds of things. That's not really where we're going with this. But to uh, um, to only think of ourselves and to think that we're creating our own experiences is something that's selfish, but it isn't. Um, so, again, it's something else that we're stopped from understanding who we are because we're not supposed to be thinking about ourselves and, and being able to create uh, positively <clears throat> out in the world. Um, but that's not to say that we don't think of others. Um, and that's this is the kind of difficulty of understanding that it does start with, with yourself, which is uh, it, within that quote, it does start with yourself, but it's then how you interact with the world as well. So or with one, one question on that, though, and this is a question I contemplate all the time. Is there separate selves? Like, is there is there one self that is like all things that encompasses all things, or is there separate individuated portions? Is it somehow? Well, there is it's one? like yeah. it's like the ocean. You know, it's there's there's an ocean, and we're all, if you like, 
droplets within the ocean, you know, that would be completely different without um, each droplet making part of right. it. So n not individual. Mm, this is the difficult point of knowing that we're all, we are all one, but we are experiencing as if we are different, as if we are many. As we're individual. Yeah. It's the, it's the one, there is one self, one God, one creator, one creative force, whatever names people want to put on it, which is exploring itself. Mm. Okay. So it's like, let, let's just call it consciousness. So it doesn't get into any uh, religious connotations. So the self consciousness uh, is exploring itself, but because it is limitless, it's a never ending task. Mm. It's not limited by anything. So it's for, so that's why it's been forever and goes on forever. There is no beginning or end to consciousness as the self. But in exploring itself and all permutations of anything is what uh, is happening. Now, we are that self. Yeah. And as Dawn was alluding to, we are the one, but appearing as the many modulating if you will yeah, just modulating it's, in different ways it's it's hard to get your head around that but again because we run up as i said right at the beginning of this we run up about we run into the fact that we can only think three-dimensionally we can't grasp anything that's outside of three dimensions but we can allude to it and we can experience it in and that's why again in the east they recommend uh, meditation and contemplation to free the mind so that it can expand it can become aware of these uh, of, of a greater reality and your greater self you know because we are limitless we are immortal we are extremely powerful and these ideas are what has been kept from us for obvious reasons, because as people come into their power and realize they're limit, limitless and create their reality in the same way as you create the circumstances in your dream state, albeit uh, seemingly unconsciously. But as we become more conscious that we create our reality based on what we believe is possible and not possible, then we can start to change things. And this is why um, I try to encourage people to uh, not concentrate on the things they don't want, but to only concentrate on the things that they do want. And I often use the little analogy of uh, anyone who's familiar with the film, The Matrix, and the very first film, which was, in my mind, always the best one anyway. Um, and I think it was in the first one where the Neo comes across the little bald headed girl who's bending a spoon. And uh, he wants to have a go at that. And uh, she watches him struggle and then said, you're, you're trying to bend the spoon and that's impossible. And if you think about it, because what he was doing is he's creating the spoon and then trying to bend it. Well, you're fighting yourself because you're creating a spoon. What you or have to do quote, is, like there is no spoon, right? That's yeah, like, or, exactly. or you think of a bent spoon. Mm -hmm. uh, and create a bent spoon, not try to bend an already straight spoon. And this is the reality. This is the problem we have with our reality. If we concentrate on the things that we don't want, we're giving conscious, creative energy to those things. And this is why I often say, be careful about going on protests, mm -hmm. because if you're protesting against a government or the police or something like that, you're giving energy to that. You're trying to bend the spoon and create the spoon at the same time. And that is what leads to trouble. So concentrate on what you want. There's nothing wrong with people gathering together to show solidarity and to exchange ideas, but work from a positive point of view to create the situation that you want. This change that the world's going through at the moment, you know, is a great opportunity for, and the reason for it, which is what uh, Klaus Schwab and others might say, um, the reason for it is to bring about this awakening in consciousness for humanity as a whole, so that they can become aware that they are conscious creators, but to change the reality, not through violence, because that's yeah. been tried many times in the past, hasn't it, with revolutions and wars 
and has never worked because we're we're still in the same situation, aren't we? <laughs> Even after thousands of years, it's still the same. And so say it's human nature, which I don't think is true either. No. So it's to bring about this awakening and for us to realize that we change things consciously. It's a changing consciousness. It's to create from love because uh, the, the sim most simple and only rule is do no harm, which I'm sure people have come across. So we can create. And if we create with the idea that we are not going to cause harm, that and we expect and give all our creative power to the idea that we want uh, it will come about and because as Dawn said we are like looking at ourselves from a an individual consciousness point of view um, we are I often call it uh, you know the molecules in an ocean if you think of the ocean as the ocean of consciousness and we are each uh, whereas each molecule of water has its own identity, but it is still part of the ocean. And, and, and that's the same for us when we think of ourselves in terms of individual consciousness. Uh, it's only how we're viewing ourselves, but we're still part of the ocean. We are the ocean. We're not something lesser. We are the ocean. Uh, and that's quite a strange thing for people to get their head around as just how powerful they are. I often refer to uh, one of the early Christian mystics, uh, I think it was Clements of Alexandria, who used to teach his pupils to practice being God. That's actually what he said to them, practice being God. Now, a lot of people think that's blasphemous and uh, get all irate about it, but this is an indication of what our true nature is. You know, we are the ocean. We are the one appearing as the many. And that's another thing for people to have a, a, a little bit of contemplation about. We are the one appearing as the many, and we have tremendous creative power. And this idea of what we truly are is, as I said earlier, is what the dark powers <laughs> are desperately trying to keep from us. And that's why the education system, right from day one, when you start at school, it's all about making you feel small, you know, and that you have to pay homage to authority, you know, whether it's the teacher or the school governor or the police or and so on. And then when you get to work, you know, it's the boss. And you're always uh, supposedly subservient to someone else. You're never given credit for what you truly are. That's kept mm -hmm. from you in every way, shape and form. Even through the religions, uh, it is, you know, they don't, because even the religions, as they are today, um, you're supposed to work through some mediator between you and God, yeah. rather than to be it and be in direct contact uh you know there's another religion that does that today as well <laughs> yes like health yes so uh, this is really what understanding the nature of reality is all about it's yes it's to understand what this reality is that it's not some solid and separate thing to you that it's uh, and you are not some small insignificant flesh and blood being that uh, is living in a world that is solid and separate to you mm. and you're having to interact with it and deal with it. And basically for most of the time, uh, you feel like you're a victim of circumstance. You don't realize that you can create the circumstances. In fact, you do create them, but for the most part, you do it unconsciously because yeah. it's based on your fears, either this person or that person or this government or that police force is going to get you, or should I say, this virus, this germ is going to get you. These things that you fear because you're told to. You're told that they exist and that they're out to get you. And so you you suffer in that way. Um, Which is why a huge piece of it is, is the externalization or the outsourcing of knowledge to something outside of you that that knows better than you do about your own individual reality, that you are supposed to completely lean on their perceptions, research, studies, their education, and that all of your observations, experience, perceptions, the information you've come across, your own research, that's all to be held as irrelevant and you're not supposed to pay attention to it. Yes, and that's why it starts in school because um, children are known, you know, when they're small, known to be far more intuitive and open to uh, 
uh shall we say sort of non-physical kind of experiences you know mm -hmm. they have their you know kind of imaginary friends who go you know it's, it's very patronizing oh you know they're there but who knows what kind of um communications they're having with uh, with other state within other states of consciousness and and that's definitely squashed quashed and sort of pushed out no sort of you know school is then about you know these learning these so-called facts which of course well, mostly aren't facts anyway um but that's that's the point of quashing people to stop them realizing mm -hmm. just what's uh, well stop them being able to think that it's it's good to kind of look inside yourself and to to trust how you feel to trust what's inside of you you know you can't trust yourself as you as you said you have to trust these external yep. authorities and that's that's how they get you and that's that's where everything kind of starts going wrong but that's why we've got to start taking things back to ourselves and it's not about being selfish but it's understanding who we are because then you then you can interact as i said before you know with the world in a different way but from a place of understanding and knowing who you are and what you are then creating and your experience understanding your experiences to help, how you can change them what you can do about it how to interact with people and to help people just understand a little more of the power of consciousness shall we say is we can come back to the sort of medical system really uh with the placebo effect and the nocebo effect mm -hmm. uh you know where people can either become ill through having poor beliefs about what can happen to them or can cure themselves of things and it's, this is many many examples of this that we came across when we were studying the medical system and uh, uh well i'll, I'll I'll mention it again because one of the most bizarre ones that we came across was uh, placebo surgery. Now, you know, people may have all heard about placebo pills, you know, where they're given a sugar pill, but unknowingly given a sugar, they don't know it is, but they're told that it's going to cure them of whatever it is and they get better. But placebo surgery? And uh, we came across an orthopedic surgeon, American orthopedic surgeon, I think we, I think it's in our book, <laughs> um, where he wanted to, they wanted to do an experiment his expertise was in uh, knee surgery where people were having painful knees and uh, his operation was to sort of uh, make some incisions into the knee uh, flush it out the debris and sew it back up again um, so they did an experiment where they had a group of the people who they did the normal experiment uh, normal operation with where they made the incision flushed out the knee sewed it back up again but the other group, unbeknown, of course, uh, um, he just made the incisions in the knees, didn't do anything, and sewed it back up again. And found, to his surprise, that he had almost exactly the same results from both groups of people. Oh, so, cool. so much so that he said, with this operation, he said, which he's been doing for years, he said, is obviously completely pointless. And I've got to stop wow. doing it. <laughs> and this was an orthopedic surgeon so and that's the power of the mind uh power of belief so it's only a small leap from that when you realize just how much control you can have over your own body dependent mm -hmm. on your beliefs either good or bad so you can have either good results or bad results so it's not too great a leap to realize that in the same way as you can control your dream people call it lucid dreaming when you sort of come awake in a dream and you can start to manipulate it well you can come awake in this reality think of it as a state of consciousness mm. and with the knowledge of what this reality is and with the knowledge of the power you have as a conscious creator mm -hmm. you can then start to manipulate this reality and bring about changes you control your experiences um, you do it anyway, whether you believe it or not. Most people do it unconsciously. And what we're trying to say, because all the evidence, uh, I mean, again, we're trying to uh, condense years of research, not just by us, but by other people as well, into uh, roughly an hour. We yep. <laughs> got like uh, nine more minutes. It's, it's to be able to start experimenting. And I, I, I likened it only the other day when I was talking to someone. It's a bit like uh, going to the gym, really and uh, building your muscles up you know to start with you can't pick much up but uh, over a period of time you build your muscles up and you can start to pick up bigger weights well it's the same with 
using your conscious creating abilities. You know, you have to build up your confidence, uh, possibly, and it'll work quickly, more quickly for some than others. And but you have to, like uh, the Maharaj said, you have to not only want it, but you have to believe you can do it. It's no good thinking, oh, I'll give it a bit of a try. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. Mm-hmm. Well, that's <laughs> that. You need more than that. You know, it'd be or otherwise it'd be like with the weights, not really believing you can do it. So, and then it builds up confidence. You know, the more results you get and you think, crikey, you know, I've brought that about in my Mm. reality. I've changed the circumstances. I've got more favorable experiences because that's what I wanted. I demanded. I expected, you know. Um, You know, it's so crazy about that, too, is like with with the human condition, especially with what's been impressed upon us, the propaganda, the limiting beliefs. Um, or, or, you know, the traumas we've experienced that so many people who are understanding of this, that we are co-creators of our reality, even me to some extent still fall prey to like feelings of helplessness for sometimes days on end. We're like, Oh, I'm just in such a rut right now. I can't do this. I can't do that. It's crazy that we know this to be fundamentally true. We've experienced it. Right. And then we still fall prey, fall back onto that conditioning sometimes. Yeah. Well, it is conditioning, as you say, but it's sometimes just to, uh, you know, kind of keep finding different ways to understand what you're doing. So, I mean, it's not to say, oh, it's, you know, it's a bad thing that you've, yeah. you're feeling like that, but it's to understand what's brought that about. Mm-hmm. And then that takes you onto a, a new sort of, understanding and then you can kind of implement other ways of thinking though you know and and again it's sort of gaining confidence and sometimes it it can feel pretty tough but it's to always to to know that you are always learning however tough it feels so sometimes those tough moments are for you to then take a step you know or even a leap forward in your understanding um, because it's it's an ongoing journey of learning and understanding and implementing so it's It's, uh, there was something I was listening to the other day that uh, they were saying there's no such thing as a bad experience. So, uh, I mean... It's which, experience, right? It's just experience. It, exactly. It's it's then what you learn from it. Mm-hmm. And these are always learning experiences. And it's, you know, some of them can be very tough, very challenging. But it's how we implement, how we see them. And to not be uh, drawn back into feeling helpless i mean it can feel it sometimes when you know you get overwhelmed but it's to understand that you aren't really but as you say it's the conditioning that makes us feel like we are victims and that that's that's what we've got to learn our way out of and one of the one of the little tips where that we can give to people when they're starting to get used to creating their own reality as it were is to change desire into expectation you know it's one thing to desire something to happen but it's having that change in mindset where you actually expect it 100 percent. you're not doubting at all that you can do this so mm. it's changing desire into expectation and that's where the real power sits and uh, and also not to be too prescriptive about what it is you want you know you don't have details, to yeah. you don't have to think out all the details like well uh, if we want a better world, uh, we've got to change this president and that president, and uh, we've got to have a, get rid of the army. We've got no. You don't have to do all of that. Rather than the detail leading up to it, it's the outcome yeah. that you're holding in your mind. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we want we want a, a free and loving and peaceful world. For hmm. instance, you know, we don't have to write, make a list of all the details. Well, how are we going to get there? You know, we don't have to do that. Go protest, um, right? Your congressman. <laughs> yeah. You know. uh, but, you know, and these, these things will come about. You have the end goal. It, it's like I said, you concentrate on what you want, not what you don't want. It's mm. like the old saying of uh, love, peace, don't hate war. Yeah. You know, just love, peace, concentrate on what you want and take the energy away from the, all the stuff that you don't want. Don't think about it. And it'll just, even, when, right, even when you say, I don't want war, your mind is focusing on war. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Right? Yes. It's it's the the spoon, isn't it? You know, mm-hmm. whatever you concentrate that the spoon is there, it will be there. Mm-hmm. So you've got to have something else. What Create what you want, not what you don't want. And take it is, it take the energy... Taking- Take the energy away by not 
thinking about the stuff you don't want, mm. only about what you do want. And expect it. Don't just desire it. Expect it to happen because you are the creator. You have that power to do it. And that's that's a big thing for most people because they've been taught that that's just, uh, you know, who who the hell do you think you are? You know, well, you're all powerful. That's who you mm. are. And as people get used to that, then they'll come into their power and be able to express it more. And that's that's where it that's where the secret lies, if you like. And then there are always opportunities for, uh, you know, doing things towards uh, towards your goal, if you like. So it's not about sort of sitting back and just expecting, you know, it's taking action as well. And then, you know, you find the, the right people turn up in your life that help you take the steps in the right direction and then it all and the synchronicities those kind of uh things will start happening more often and then you can see that you know this is this is working you know that's your sort of feedback that you're you know kind of um moving forward with this you know i mean synchronicities are fantastic aren't they you know when it's just things things happen you think well that's you know that 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 was just amazing how did that happen you know but uh, th that's all part of it to show you that you know these things are falling into place yeah especially like as you're on that inward path right like that path back into the self into yourself rather than you know outsourcing your knowledge again you find that synchronicities happen more often more frequently and then at first it's really crazy and then after a while you're like oh yeah this that makes sense of course this happens now yeah yes definitely yeah uh, I mean, there's obviously so much more to this that we can talk about. You know, we can talk about, but we probably, because we've been going an hour, it's probably better if we break this up into yep. several parts if you want to. Yeah, I'll just, you know what I'll do? I'll just message, I'll just message Don on Telegram. We need to get you on Telegram too, David, at, at some point. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'll just message Don and we'll, we'll sort through some ideas. And maybe <clears throat> for the people who are watching this, if you have any questions about the nature of reality, um, then you could submit them to me and I can uh, have uh, Don and David contemplate on it before we come on to the next session. So yeah, I think, I think it's a good place, place to wrap it up. Yeah. Some things that uh, are just as pointers that people might like to think about, and then we can explain them next time, is um, how we create time. Because time is not a, a thing. It's a, it's a conscious creation in the mm. same way that space is. So space and time are created by us. And we can explain how we create time and we can explain explain about uh, probabilities we can explain how and this is a weird one for people but i'll leave it with them because it's a teaser is to explain that they don't have a fixed past mm. in the same way as they don't have a fixed future they don't have a fixed past and people will go oh that's just crazy you know but when it's explained, you'll see you don't have a fixed past. We are all more powerful than that. We have lots of different pasts and we pick and choose what we want to retain in what we'll call physical memory. And we put wow. that together and think that's our past. But we have many and we can change. We can even from our present point, and we call it the present point is the point of power. So. And I'll, I'll leave people to have a think about this. Um, if there is something you believe in your past, which was an unpleasant experience, that is still affecting your present, there's a technique for going back. Once you know that you don't have a fixed past, you can go back and look at that and you can choose another of your past experiences, another probability and once you put your energy into that alternative probability where perhaps that uh, experience happened a different way or even didn't happen at all, once you put your energy into that other past that you thought you had, um, you'll find that your present situation changes in line with the new past that you've decided to adopt. It's very, very powerful and very weird, I know. for people. It is mind-blowing. It is mind-blowing. But we can talk more about that next time. <laughs> yeah, that's a good place to end. <laughs> leave the leave the uh, viewers mind blown. So, thank you, Don and David, for joining me, and we will reschedule this for another time for part two. Love to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alec.